good morning and welcome. We're so glad that you're here today. I am super excited to start us in our new summer series that we have entitled One Commandment, Learning to Love. And we are going to be exploring the 10 commandments during this series. But wait, I thought you named it One Commandment. And now you're going to talk about the 10 commandments? Well, now that I've confused us, I think it's best that we pray and invite the Holy Spirit to be our teacher today. And so, Holy Spirit, we welcome you today to be the teacher. God, we thank you for this season of summer. And we thank you, God, that you want to teach us about your commandments. And so we're asking God for ears to hear and open hearts. We welcome you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's start off with a little quiz today. Can you name the Ten Commandments? Research was done about 15 years ago where they asked 1,000 people if they could recall the Ten Commandments. And what they discovered is that people could more easily name the seven ingredients in a McDonald's Big Mac and the TV characters from the famed TV show, The Brady Bunch, before they could recall the Ten Commandments. And something tells me that if we repeated that research today, that people could more easily tell you the menu items at Chick-fil-A and the cast of Friends before they could recite the Ten Commandments. And yet... The Ten Commandments are a symbol of Christianity. In fact, for many, they are synonymous with faith. When you hear the phrase Ten Commandments, what comes to your mind? Perhaps you remember uh, one or two of the commandments, like do not murder or no other gods before God. Perhaps you have a visual pop into your head like Charlton Heston from the famous movie back in the 1950s, that actor who played Moses, or or maybe you think about like a little cartoon Moses holding up like little stone tablets. It's interesting the images that come to our mind when we think about the Ten Commandments. Maybe you think about rules or law. Maybe you think of them as foundational. Maybe you think of them as outdated. There are many emotions that we feel when we think about the Ten Commandments. In fact, it's actually kind of interesting to look at our American culture because this has been a topic of debate for many, many years, and there have been battles over the Ten Commandments. In 1978, Kentucky passed a law that said that every classroom had to have the Ten Commandments posted. And just two years later, in 1980, the U.S. Supreme Court actually ruled that that was unconstitutional. But the battle is not over. In fact, this spring, Texas tried to pass a law that would mandate that the Ten Commandments Commandments be prominently placed in classrooms. Now, that law did fail, but right now, Tennessee is also trying to pass a law about the Ten Commandments being put into classrooms. Many people have the Ten Commandments posted in their home or in their business, but not everyone agrees with this push to get the Ten Commandments posted in public places. In fact, many people, they scoff at this idea. They believe that these rules are outdated or they no longer apply or they never applied in the first place. And of course, as our American culture has become more pluralistic with many different faiths, right? Muslim and Jewish and Hindu and often a mixture of faith or no faith at all, uh, people have some strong opinions about the Ten Commandments. While we as Christians want religious freedom, many argue that they also want religious freedom or of their faith or lack thereof faith. And so it's kind of easy to see how the Ten Commandments has become this hotly debated topic. And so this leads us to ask a question. What do you think about the Ten Commandments? What do we as a church think about the Ten Commandments? Are we supposed to be following these Ten Commandments? Are they essential for us to enter into eternal life? You know, I think it can be confusing to understand if the Ten Commandments are still relevant because of where the Ten Commandments are placed in the Bible. They're found in the Old Testament, and we know that in the Old Testament, Jesus has not yet come. And so I think it's a natural question to say, well, since Jesus has come, do the Ten Commandments still matter? Are they still relevant? So many questions. Well, Jesus is actually going to make it easy on us. He's going to give us one commandment, but... He is a master teacher. And within this one commandment, the other 10 are actually covered. And so I want to go to John 13. This is going to be our text this morning. And a little bit of context here. Jesus is talking with his disciples. And it is soon, uh, soon he'll be betrayed and arrested and put to death. But on this evening, he's encouraging his disciples. He's he's speaking with them. and, And he wants to 
to give them a new commandment. This is John 13, verse 34. So now I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Hmm. What is Jesus doing here? He's giving them a new commandment. Now, interestingly, the word here, uh, new, in the Greek, doesn't mean like recent or different. Rather, it means fresh or unworn. And so this commandment isn't new in the sense that it's different. It's new in the sense that it is fresh. It is unworn. Jesus is giving us a new command to love each other. Now, does this surprise you? It doesn't really surprise me, but it seems so simple and yet so difficult at the same time. I think this is especially true in our day and age because our culture has done such a number on defining love in our world. Love is viewed as tolerance. Love is viewed as agreeing with every single person, blessing all behaviors, celebrating choices made by one another. And let me tell you, as a mother of four, ranging from teenager to three-nager, three that's where your three-year-old believes she's a teenager, there are many things that my children do that are not lovely. And so I believe we've gotten confused about love. And so I think we need to ask a few more questions. What is love? And how do we actually love? Well, what's interesting here is that Jesus gives us a clue in that text in, in John 13, 34. He says that we are going to love just as we have been loved. And so God's love for us is going to be a clue for how we are to love others. His love is going to unlock love in our lives. So we actually need to see what he says about what love is. And so we're gonna go to another scripture. We're gonna go to 1 John 4 this time. And this is what real love is. Verse 10, this is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Verse 15, all who declare that Jesus is the son of God have God living in them. And we have put our trust in his love. Oh, I'm sorry, have God living in them and they live in God. Verse 16, we know how much God loves us and we have put our trust in his love. God is love and all who live in love live in God and God lives in them. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. This is the key, verse 19. We love each other because he loved us first. So implied in this new command meant that Jesus gives us is that we must believe and receive his love. It's from a place of being loved that we can actually turn around and love others. I'd like to think of it this way. We, until we know that we're beloved by God, we actually can't be love to others. This is the key. When we put our trust in God, we actually learn to live a different way. One of our goals here at the Vineyard, what our mission is that we would encounter his love because we know that when we encounter his love, our whole life is changed. His love actually becomes the charge of our battery. Now, my poor phone, I don't know if anyone else's phone is on life support. I probably just need a new phone. But that phone just dies all day long. And it's this, it's this phone, it has all these apps and capacity, but unless it has a charge, it's useless. And I think for many of us, we are living our lives without being fully charged on God's love. Humanity was, was created. You were designed to actually operate on the Father's love. Now, sure, can we try to love people? and be kind to people in our own strength, we can. But what we discover is that we don't have what it takes. We, we can't sustain the type of love that is needed to actually live life to its fullest. But when we receive God, when we believe in his love, what happens is that actually we begin to live in him and he is love. We become rooted in his love and his love actually leaks out of us. And so it's from this place that we're actually able to love one another. What I love is there's a fascinating promise in John 13, if we go back. I read verse 34, but let's read verse 35 now. It says this, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. I love this promise. So the promise is that when we follow this new commandment, that actually the world's gonna take notice. They're gonna know, oh, these are disciples of Jesus. This is actually supposed to be the marker for us, how we love our families, how we love our coworkers, how we love our neighbors, how we love our community. People should be saying, what is up with them? 
They are different. They are weird. Yes, that's actually what, what God's saying. People should wonder, and the new commandment is this, there is one commandment, to love others as we have been loved. Okay, that's super exciting. But what about the 10 commandments? I thought you said this series was gonna be about the 10 commandments. It is gonna be about the 10 commandments because we have misunderstood what the 10 commandments are all about. You see, the 10 commandments were God's instructions to his people, and they were all about loving him and loving one another. And so what we need to do is we actually need to understand that the purpose, the meaning behind the the Ten Commandments was to deepen our relationship with God and to deepen our relationship with other people. And so we're going to go on this journey. We're going to explore what are the Ten Commandments really all about. And I think we're going to be shocked to discover that it's actually not about us being good enough or pleasing God enough or staying in line. No, it's so much more beautiful than that. God is inviting us into something super rich. And so today, I'm gonna start our series by answering four questions, okay? The first question is this, what led to the 10 commandments? I think it's important that we understand how we got to the place where the 10 commandments were even given. Secondly, what is the purpose of the 10 commandments, which we've talked about a little bit? Number three, what are the 10 commandments? And finally, what do they mean for us today? Okay, so with that, I'm going to jump into what led to the Ten Commandments. And in order to understand the story of the Ten Commandments, we actually have to go to the book of Exodus in the Bible. Now, the book of Exodus is all about the Exodus or the mass departure of God's people from Egypt into the Promised Land. And this is a very important story in the Bible. In fact, it's called, uh, it's called something that it's called the controlling narrative of the Bible, and that's really important because it's the story that helps us understand who God is, who we are, how we relate to him, and what we end up discovering in the story of the Exodus is this, our God is a God of redemption. Our God is a God who takes bondage in our lives and takes us into freedom. And we're gonna see this over and over again. And so this narrative is super duper important. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to just give us a quick history lesson and I'm gonna do this storytelling style. And so you can just sit back and relax and let me tell you the story of what led to the 10 commandments. So in the Bible, God chose a man named Abraham and he promised to bless Abraham, to bless his family, to bless uh, land, bless him with a promised land and to make him into a great nation. And this is incredible. He tells Abraham, your descendants are going to be like the stars in the sky and the sand, the grains of sand on the ground. And so this is incredible. Well, Abraham has a miracle son named Isaac. Isaac has a son named Jacob. Jacob has 12 sons. And one of those sons is Joseph. Now, Joseph was a very special son to Jacob. He loved Joseph so much. In fact, he gave him a special striped coat that you might remember from the story in Genesis. But unfortunately, Joseph and his brothers really struggled to get along because they were jealous of Joseph. And Joseph didn't do the best job, you know, handling the favor that was on his life. Well, his brothers end up selling him into slavery and he ends up in Egypt. And when Joseph gets to Egypt, his life is really up and down. He has some amazing moments and he also has some terrible moments. But the favor of the Lord is on his life. And through a dream, he's able to help Egypt prepare for a terrible famine. And Egypt has food. Well, Jacob and his brothers hear that, Israel, or hear that Egypt has food. And so his brothers travel to Egypt. And there's this crazy dramatic reunion with Joseph and his brothers. And he's, Joseph is able to save his family from starvation. And what ends up happening is that Jacob and his whole family end up moving to Egypt and resettle there. And then, of course, Jacob eventually dies. And the people stay there and they multiply. And for a while, life is really good in Egypt. But eventually, the Egyptians enslave the Hebrew people. And so they are their workforce and the conditions have gotten terrible. So terrible, in fact, um, that it's become dire. 
Pharaoh decides, that's the ruler of Egypt, he decides he needs to control the population of the Hebrews because they are just multiplying too quickly. And so he instructs the midwives actually to kill the, Egypt, the Hebrew baby boys. Well, Moses' mom does not obey this. And if you know the story, Moses is placed into a basket into the Nile River where he is actually found by the daughter of Pharaoh, an Egyptian princess, and she adopts him. Moses is raised in, in Pharaoh's castle. And then eventually he makes a mistake. He ends up in the wilderness for 40 years. And then God calls Moses to free his people. Well, Moses goes to Pharaoh and he says, God says, let my people go. Well, Pharaoh's like, this is my workforce, no. And so what ends up happening is the greatest showdown, um, and one of the greatest showdowns in the Bible, the 10 plagues. And I don't have time today to explain how symbolic each of those uh, plagues were, but each one dealt with a God that was in Egypt where Yahweh, our God, the God, is proving he is the king of the world. And so systematically, he goes through this, but Pharaoh's heart is hard until Pharaoh's very own son dies in the last plague, and then he decides to let the Israelites, the Hebrew people, go. Well, of course, he then changes his mind, and so he chases after them into the wilderness, and God splits the Red Sea, and the Israelites walk through the land, and they get to the other side, and then the Egyptians come, and the water crashes down on them, and God saves Israel again. Okay, so it's important that we know these are all the events that has led up to the moment where the people of God are going to get the 10 commandments. Context is so important when we're understanding the Bible. Okay, so now let's talk about what is the purpose of the 10 commandments? You know, throughout the Exodus, the Lord really establishes this. He is the true king. He is the one who delivers. He is the one who saves. But now he needs to establish the guidelines with which they are going to relate to him and to one another. For the ancient Israelites, the right conception of God and the right relationship with him, it provided the foundation for both personal and communal ethics. And I actually think this is beautiful. I think this is actually what we should do too, that have, having the right ideas of God and the right relationship with him should affect our behavior and our actions. What we believe about God affects how we behave. Okay, so listen, the, the Lord has just delivered them 10 plagues in Egypt, and now he's about to give them 10 commandments. This is on purpose. The number 10 symbolizes perfection, completion. In fact, the Hebrew people thought of the 10 commandments as the 10 words, even though there was obviously more than 10 words. But a couple of things I want us to understand about the purpose of these commandments. These commandments were not given to people outside of relationship with God so that they could access him, okay? They, they weren't requirements that had to be met in order for, a pe for, for people to initiate a relationship with God. And they weren't a way for people to earn their salvation. Okay, these commandments, this covenant, which is just a, a fancy word for agreement, was God's initiative. This was God's plan. This was God's idea. These were God's instructions for how to live the best life for the people he had already saved. He'd already saved them. He'd saved them from Egypt. He'd, he'd taken them through you know, the wilderness. He'd gotten them through the Red Sea. He had already saved the people. And now he's saying, listen up. We gotta, we gotta make an agreement. This is how you're gonna treat me and this is how you're gonna treat others. So what does this mean? This means that God's commandments are given for our good. God gave them to us because he wanted to honor the dignity that he had already given us when he saved us. These covenantal commands, they were based on respect and love for God and others. And they are truly God's best way to live in abundance, in love with God and man. So the goal, the purpose of the 10 commandments, again, is to deepen our relationship with God and to deepen our relationship with others. The purpose is to learn to love. And that's what we're going to do together. Now, keep in mind, the Egyptians are leaving captivity in Egypt and they're establishing a new society. Well, just naturally think about that. They're leaving a land that they knew and they're going to a new place. In Egypt, there were many gods that were worshiped. There was something called polytheism, meaning there were many gods. There was a way of doing life. There was a way of relating to one another. And now they're going to a new place. And God is like, don't take that junk here. 
I've got a better way for you. I've got a better system for you. God does not want them taking the things that they weren't supposed to take into the new land, the promised land, which was, had been promised to Abraham all those years ago, a place that was filled with uh, milk and honey. And unfortunately, that land that they were going to, it was also filled with polytheism. It was also filled with things that were going to tempt them and confuse them. And so God's calling them to something different. He wants his people to have a reset. He's giving them instructions on how to live their best life. And I think about how relevant this is for us today. We live in a world where many things are worshiped that are not God. We live in a world that it's so easy to mistreat other people. And I believe that what God's asking us to do this summer, I, I believe he's asking us to reset. I believe he's saying, hey, I have a best way for your life. I have good instructions. You should read what I've written and you should follow my commandments. We can easily become enslaved to things in our lives. God, God wants to take us out of bondage. And so where there is bondage in your life, I believe that there is an opportunity for freedom this summer. Okay, so let's, let's spend a little bit of time just talking about what are the 10 commandments? Well, as we've established, God has made a covenant. He's made an agreement with his people. And now he needs to actually give them the rules or the instructions that he has for them. And so with, with that, let's go to Exodus 20. That's one of the places we can find the 10 commandments in the Bible. And I'm going to read just a couple of verses because we need to talk about the context. Again, I know lots of context today. This is verse one. Then God gave the people all these instructions. I am the Lord, your God, who rescued you from the land of Egypt, the place of your slavery. Okay. So what we discover right here is that Yahweh or God, he starts off with a pretty bold reminder. He says, hey, I'm the king. I'm the one who rescued you. I'm the one who took you out of bondage. And so as I give you these instructions, I'm reminding you, this is who I am. And I think that we need to be reminded who God is. He is the king. He is the one who gives us instructions. He is the one that we follow. Now, what is confusing here is that if you know the story of the Ten Commandments, you know that Moses actually goes up on a mountain and God writes the Ten Commandments on the tablets. But if you kept reading in verse three, the 10 commandments are listed right there. So what we need to do right now is we need to jump down to verse 18 because this is actually what happened when God began to speak these words, okay? He says this, when the people heard the thunder and the loud blast of the ram's horn, and when they saw the flashes of lightning and the smoke billowing from the mountain, they stood at a distance trembling with fear. And they said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen but don't let God speak directly to us or we will die. Don't be afraid, Moses answered them, for God has come in this way to test you and so that your fear of him will keep you from sinning. As the people stood in the distance, Moses approached the dark cloud where God was. Okay, so at first, God is speaking to all the people, but then they get scared. Okay, there's a mountain, there's smoke, there's thunder, there's lightning, it's intense. I mean, They've been through a lot. Can we cut them like a little bit of slack that they were like a little bit scared at this point, right? They're like, okay, this is like the straw that broke the camel's back. I, we can't do it anymore. Moses, you go up the mountain. And if we read later in Exodus, this is Exodus 34. This is actually what happened when Moses went up the mountain. It says, Moses remained there on the mountain with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. In all that time, he ate no bread and drank no water. And the Lord wrote the terms of the covenant, the 10 commandments on the stone tablets. Okay, so what happens? Moses goes up Mount Sinai, and there God gives him the Ten Commandments written with his own finger on the stone tablets. Okay, so let's read the Ten Commandments. Let's, for those of you who would have failed the quiz at the beginning, here's your second chance right now. Okay, so starting in verse three, number one, I'm gonna break them up. So I'm gonna read four, and then I'm gonna pause. Number one, you must not have any other God but me. Two, you must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. Three, you must not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Number four, remember to observe the Sabbath by keeping Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Okay, we're gonna pause. This is the first four commandments. And these commandments all center around our relationship with God. God, giving us instructions on how we are to love the Lord our God. Again, 
Remember the context with which the people are hearing these words. They've just come out of Egypt. In Egypt, there's lots of gods. There's lots of idols. There's lots of things that are going to divert them away from what Yahweh is calling them to. True worship, monotheism, where there is one God. He is breaking paradigms. He is resetting them and their lives of faith. And again, I want us to think about our own lives. We need a resetting. We need to remember who we worship. And these first four instructions are all about us learning, again, how do we love the Lord? And we know that it's all tied into he first loving us. We can't love him the way he deserves to be loved without first receiving his love. And then in turn, okay, Lord, there are ways that benefit me loving you. There are ways that help me to love you more. And so I think that there's some reflecting that we need to do this summer. Have we been seduced by materialism, by sex, by self? Are we worshiping things that we were not created to worship? I believe that there is freedom for each and every one of us. The Holy Spirit, he wants to help us. Now, I want you to listen because we're going to read the last six commandments. And I want you to listen to the focus of these commandments. This is number five. Honor your father and mother. Then you will live a long life full in the land the Lord your God is giving you. Number six, you must not murder. Number seven, you must not commit adultery. Number eight, you must not steal. Number nine, you must not testify falsely against your neighbor. Number 10, you must not covet your neighbor's house. You must not covet your neighbor's wife, male or female servant, ox or donkey, or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. Okay, did you notice the focus of the last six? They're all about others, how we relate to one another in a covenantal community. We are going to need to learn to love one another because that's actually God's best. And I think what's interesting here is that we're going to have to study, you know, in the ancient times, Living together was a really big and important part of their lives. Their life actually depended upon healthy relationships with one another. In order to to survive, they needed one another. In order to thrive, they actually needed one another. And so how they treated one another, how they related to each other, it actually deeply impacted their day-to-day life. And I actually think that this is a prophetic picture for us. You see, I think that so often we have actually pushed relationship to the side. We thought, you know what, we can do it on our own. We don't need one another, but if we're honest, relational skills are really lacking. Anger and jealousy and betrayal are just far too common. They're far too common. We become so individualistic in Western culture that we've just lost the richness of doing life with one another, but God is inviting us to live by a different standard. He's actually going to teach us his best principles for how we are to relate to one another. And the hope is that as we learn to love one another, that our families are gonna be changed, that our neighborhoods are gonna be changed, that our workplace is gonna be changed. And ultimately, the world will be changed because we know that when we love as he loves us, the world will know we are his disciples. We have amazing news to share with people. We have been designed to live in love. Our God is a God who takes us from bondage and brings us to freedom. And that's the good news we get to share with other people. Now, if we read the Old Testament, we discover that the Israelites really struggled to follow these 10 rules plus the other 600 rules that would end up getting put into place. And because of that, I think it's really easy to think of the 10 commandments, to think of the law as bad. Oh, that was bad. But I want us to think differently. Because the law was not evil or bad, it was perfect. The problem has always been us. We are imperfect. We are unable to keep God's law. Now, God is so gracious. From the very beginning, he he created a system that could help atone for our mistakes, atone for our sins. In the time of Moses, he created the sacrifice system where people would come and they would sacrifice animals to pay for uh, for their sins, to, to, to get forgiveness. And this is actually where the people of Israel lived for centuries, where they would try to keep God's law. They would fail. They would need sacrifices over and over and over again. And so that leads us to our final question. What do the 10 commandments mean for us today? 
Because of course, we understand, because we've read the book, that God's good plan included Jesus coming and ushering in a brand new covenant, a covenant that is actually so much better than the first covenant, where Jesus himself would become the sacrificial lamb once and for all, taking on the sins for all who believe and inviting them into a new reality. And so let's go to Hebrews 10, because this is gonna be really important. This is what the writer of Hebrews says about this new the old covenant and then the new covenant. Verse one, the old system under the law of Moses was only a shadow, a dim preview of the good things to come, not the good things themselves. Hmm. Then the writer of Hebrews, he actually goes on to talk and he says, you know, year after year, the Israelites had to make sacrifices in the old system. It served as a reminder that they were slaves to sin. They were in bondage to sin. They felt guilty. They felt condemned. Many of us feel this. Many of us feel like we're just constantly failing and we're trying and we're trying and we're trying. And I have good news for you today. There, there is a new covenant. There is a better covenant. The 10 commandments, it was a dim preview of what was to come. Let's keep reading in Hebrews 10. This is verse nine. He, that's Jesus, cancels the first covenant in order to put the second into effect. For God's will was for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. For, for by that one offering, he forever made perfect those who are being made holy. And the Holy Spirit also testifies that this is so. For he says, this is the new covenant I will make with my people on that day, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them in the, on their minds. Then he says, I will never again remember their sins and lawless deeds. And when the sins have been forgiven, there is no need to offer any more sacrifices. When we believe and receive Jesus, we live under a new covenant. You see, what God is saying here is there is a new way of relating to him, and it's through Jesus. What Jesus has done for us and as us changes everything. God loved us so much, he sent his son into the world, not to judge us, but to save us. And through Jesus, what has happened? We have been restored to right relationship with our father. We have actually been given a brand new identity in Jesus. We have been filled with his Holy Spirit, empowered to love as we've been loved so that we can actually make a difference, so that we can actually change our lives and the world. Sin, which held people in bondage, it holds people in bondage. There is a new way, and his name is Jesus. And he frees us and sets us free. And so we are now empowered to do the new commandment, to love each other just as we have been loved. So God's love, it becomes this beautiful foundation for how we do all of life. You know, the truth is, again, we can't really love God the way he deserves to be loved until we believe and receive the love that he has for us. As we receive this love, then we're able to love others. I like to think of it this way. As we receive his love, we can release his love. And so we need a revelation about this. This new commandment to love each other just as he has loved us is going to challenge us. It's gonna push us. And I believe that it's going to produce so much good fruit in our lives. And so the question begs to ask though, what about the 10 commandments? Are we required to follow those 10 commandments? Well, we're not under the law that required sacrifices when we would make mistakes because Jesus is our forever sacrifice taking care of that. But the principles of the Ten Commandments still apply today. In fact, I would argue that they are more relevant today than they have ever been. And so we're gonna put on a different set of glasses. We're gonna put on sunglasses, S-O-N glasses. And we're gonna read these, these principles through the, the lens of Jesus because this is God's best for us. This is how we deepen our relationship with him. And this is how we deepen our relationship with others. And ultimately, our hope is that each of us would have a fresh encounter with his love that we would be transformed by his love and that we'd learn to extend his love to a hurting and broken world. And so I'm gonna pray and we're gonna do some worship and I'm excited for what God wants to do this summer through this series. And so Holy Spirit, yeah, we just thank you for the journey that we're about to take. And God, I, I, I just thank you right now. I just sense like you're, you're coming with just a, a gift of humility and a gift of curiosity. God, we wanna learn to love you more fully we want to learn to love others the way that you have loved us. And so we just give you permission this summer, God, to do what you will with us. God, may we be forever changed as we partner with you. In Jesus' name, 
Amen.